Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Canadian Institute of Planners Foundation of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion in the Planning Community. I'm Beth McMahon, and I'm the CEO of the Canadian Institute of Planners, and I have the privilege to be the moderate, moderator for this session. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. As a settler, it is an honour and privilege to both work and live here. CIP has a deep and ongoing commitment to advancing truth and reconciliation in what is a long-term relationship building, learning and healing process. I know that all Canadian provincial territorial institutes and associations also share this commitment. And at CIP, we regularly exchange information on our initiatives to support reconciliation um, at a national level with our allied professions. It's a work in progress and there's still much more to do. I'd now like to give a warm welcome to Weil and Ida from HRX. I've had the opportunity to work with HRX for just over a year now as we put together our equity, diversity and inclusion roadmap. It's been um, a really interesting, difficult, uh, but rewarding process. And now I'm so pleased to be in the position that we're, we're you know, really getting into the implementation of this five-year plan. Uh, their bios are in the handout section of the control panel, and I'd encourage you to take a moment and find out more about our esteemed speakers. A little bit of housekeeping just before I turn over control to, uh, to Weil of the, uh, of the webinar. You know, unfortunately, the way this is set up, um, the way that you can interact with Weil, because I'm sure there's a lot of questions, and Ida, is through the control panel by asking questions. So you're unable to see the questions each one of you are asking, but at the end of the session, we will have the opportunity to share the questions and have, I'm sure, a really engaging Q&A. We also have um, you know, started the recording of this webinar, and it's going to be available in our learning hub. So if you have to you know, duck out early, um, you will have the opportunity to, to log into it. Um, and all of the slides in the presentation will be shared with um, everybody here within 24 hours. So, um, you know, without further ado, I'll pass it over because there's a lot of content to get through and I'm, I'm sure that we want to leave a lot of opportunity for the questions at the end. So, thanks very much. Okay, let me... Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, well, hi, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here with all of you at uh, CIP. Thanks to Beth and CIP for hosting us. My name is Weil. I have my colleague here, Aida Masbagai, um, and we are uh, we're really excited here to, to meet you, to talk to you about equity, diversity, and inclusion, something I spend like my day and night thinking about and working in. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation, to your questions, to your thoughts, to your engage engagement. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think I am ready to, to start. I'd like to start first by acknowledging um, the land uh, I live and, and operate and, and work and the land that I, uh, I arrived to here when I emigrated 10 years ago, and I absolutely loved uh, the land of the Coast Salish people here, uh, namely the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Musqueam people. Um, so that's the land, uh, and acknowledging the land is, is an important, very important thing we should do always to reflect um, on the history, on the relationship we have with this land. Um, so that's the land acknowledgement. Just a little bit of an introduction about uh, the work that we do. I am part of an organization called HRX. HRX is an equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, consulting firm. Everything we do is around this topic. There are three lines of businesses at HRX. One of them is training and workshops um, similar to, to this uh, webinar. The other one is assessment and consulting. We work with organizations to help them with processes, with systems, uh, and how to improve these systems, make them more inclusive and more equitable. And then the last one is data analytics. Um, and this is the area that I absolutely love about the work that we do. Uh, we work with organizations with thousands of employees, thousands of customers, thousands of members to analyze thousands and, and hundreds of thousands of data points and analyze if there are any gaps based on race, on gender, 
on age, on any other diversity dimension, and pay, and recruitment, and services. Uh, so that's the work that we do. We have been in this field for, for some time now. There are articles that we wrote or written about us in media outlets like um, Forbes and, and CBC. We work with uh, organizations and clients all over the country here, government, provincial government, businesses, non-for-profits. And we have research projects with a few universities um, around studying and analyzing and measuring unconscious bias. Uh, gaps in the in the market, uh, the workforce trends in terms of equity, diversity, and inclusion. This is how we structured the conversation today. You will hear from me, and then you will hear from Ida, and then you will hear from Beth. So there are a few <laughs> presenters today going through this. So I hope the time will be enough for us, uh, and we finish on time. I will start by talking about just like the the main and foundational concepts around equity, diversity, and inclusion, just so we are all have the same foundation, so we can base on that foundation uh, our conversation moving forward. I'll also talk about bias and discrimination, and then Ida will talk about equity and planning, specifically in the planning field, and then Beth will introduce you all and walk you briefly um, on the CIP EDI roadmap. So that's the agenda and the objective today, as I said, is um, to provide foundational knowledge, you know, just to give you the foundational knowledge where you can take it and uh, just take it and then build on it and, uh, and have it in your conversations and, uh, and discuss some of the concepts that are important to planners. Okay, I think if that's, we are good there, I can start the agenda. So for all of you, and I see more than 200 people here attending, I have a question. How many of you would say that they totally understand the struggles left-handed people face every day? I can't see you, raise your hand, I can't see you. <laughs> but think about that. How many of you would say you understand the struggles left-handed people face every day? Now I don't, I am a right-handed person, um, but I was interested in this topic, so I Googled it. And I was fascinated by how this world is designed for people who are right-handed like me. A few examples of, of that is you go to the bank, the pins are always to the right. That's, that's something designed for people who are right-handed like me. Zippers are designed for people like me, uh, notebooks, can openers. When I saw this for the first time, I was like, oh yeah, right. How would a left-handed person use a can opener? So I asked a friend, she is left-handed, and she told me, I learned to use it like you. There is no can opener for left-handed people. Scissors, I think many of us know that left-handed people have an issue with scissors, but we don't really know what the issue is. And then these classrooms that many of us, um, like I've been um, where all the tables uh, flip from the right side. So something designed for all for us uh, right-handed people. And all of this serves as a, a very gentle introduction to this concept of privilege. So privilege is having something of value that is denied to others simply because of the group they belong to. I didn't do anything to earn that all can openers are designed for me. I didn't stop doing anything to earn that privilege. It just happened. I was born with that thing. Privilege is two types. Advantage, we call it unearned advantage. So you have something of value that should be available to everyone, but it's not. The other one is power. You belong to a group that has power, control, authority, dominate other group. So that's, that's privilege. Now the problem with privilege is that it's invisible to those who have it. I don't wake up every morning thinking, oh, you know, I am right-handed. All these things are designed for me. I don't go to the grocery store to buy a can opener thinking, oh, this can opener is designed for me. That's amazing. I genuinely, for a very long time, thought that these can openers are designed for everyone. Like I'm not, I'm no special. And I didn't really think about that. I don't wake up in the morning thinking, oh, I am a man 
living in a in a world that dominated by men i don't i don't wake up in the morning thinking oh i don't have any mental health uh, or physical uh, disability i don't i just like go on uh, my life without thinking about my privileges however if you know and see that others have something you don't have if you are marginalized you see the privileges of others and that's the problem with privilege those who have it they don't see it and those who don't have it they see it every time all the day every every uh, every time they see see others have it now privilege is an important concept because it's reshaping and evolving our understanding of fairness for a very long time my mother this is true told me you know what while treat everyone the same give everyone the same thing that's fair that's equality treating everyone the same is equality now we started realizing that some people have privilege some people don't so giving everyone the same would not ne will never allow this person to get access to the apple right no matter what they did so now we are shifting to this new concept of um equity which is fair access to power and opportunity its simplest uh, definition we want to make sure that these three people if they make the same effort they will have the same access to the apple right and in some cases that will require different types of support for each of them so equality and equity and these are really important concepts if you uh exploring this area of equity diversity and inclusion now you could be privileged or marginalized based on any of these uh, things in your uh, experience, in your life, in the work that you do. Um, if you are in North America, based on your race, if you are white, you are privileged. The culture is dominated by people who are white. Um, based on your gender identity, if you are a man, you are privileged. Um, based on like the language you speak, I don't speak English as first language, so I am not privileged in that, in that area based on your education, based on your body, uh, sexuality, and all of that. And most of us will have a few things that they are privileged based on and a few things that are marginalized based on, you know? Um, so I would like you to think about your privileges, okay? Just think about the factors and the dimensions in your life, in your personality, in your uh, experience that make you privileged, uh, and think about that. Think about that. Which brings me to diversity. So diversity, diversity is a very simple concept. When you ask people what diversity is, most of them will, would know what you are talking about. They define it as the range of human differences, such as race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation. Um, all of these are called diversity dimensions. Now diversity is a simple concept to understand, but it's really hard to measure. You look at a group of people, they are men and women, um, different races, um, but they don't have age diversity and you're like, are they diverse? Are they not? I don't really know. It's really hard to measure. So there is a, a model we use to simplify it a bit. In the model, diversity is three types. The first one is inherent diversity. This is the diversity that you are born with. You don't have no control over it. Um, gender, race, all these things are inherent. The other one is acquired. This is the diversity that you acquire through your life. Um, me and my friend are born in Vancouver. I become an engineer. My friend becomes an accountant. Now, there is some diversity, right, that each of us acquire. I was born in Vancouver, but I lived in Hong Kong for 10 years. Now, I acquired different diversity. I learned Spanish. Now, I have exposure to different culture, right? This is acquired diversity. If you want the third type of diversity, which we call thought diversity, you need to have both types of diversity in the room. You want to have some inherent diversity and some acquired diversity. I'll give you an example. Ten people. Is in Vancouver. They lived all their life in Vancouver. Now they look very diverse, but are they?
Hmm. I think we're having some technical problems. Aida, can you see me? No? I can see you, but you cut out for a while, and now I can hear you again. <laughs> okay, good. I was talking about diversity. Sorry, I don't see everyone. I just see my screen, but I get messages <laughs> that says uh, something happened. So I was talking about diversity. Acquired diversity also is not enough, right? You want to have inherent and acquired diversity, which brings me to inclusion. Inclusion is the action or state of including or being included within a group uh, or structure. So you could be inclusive to someone or you could feel included within a structure. People feel included when they have three things. They want to be in, a, in an environment where they have access to opportunity. If I feel like my neighbor or my colleague, um, I'm having the same message again. We can hear you fine. I, I think we can hear you fine now. Okay, good. Um, if I live in a place where my colleague or my neighbor has more access to opportunity than me, I lose my sense of inclusion. So that's the first one. The second one, I want to be in a place where my differences, you know, my diversity dimensions are appreciated. I don't want to live in a place where I feel like I have to hide my identity or my sexuality or my religion. That's against the feeling of inclusion. And then the third one is empowerment. I want to be in a place where the decisions that impact me, I have a voice in making these decisions. These are the three pillars of inclusion. So that's equity, diversity, and inclusion. These are the definitions. Now, if you talk to people, people think this is a really important conversation. In uh, 2017, 87% of leaders who were surveyed by PwC said this is a very important conversation. I think if you ask them now, 99.9% .9 of these leaders will say, we really care about this topic, especially after the events that we have seen uh, since the summer. However, the gap in terms of, of equity is really big. It's massive gap. I'll give you some examples. The World Economic Forum estimates that it will take us more than 200 years to close the economic gender gap if we move with the same rate of progress. Okay, so this is one. The other one is, I don't know if you saw this article in the New York Times. The title of the article is, Fewer Women Run Big Companies Than Men Named John. Um, so they looked at S&P 1500 companies. These are the largest corporates in the States. And they looked at the names of the CEOs, the first name of the CEO. They found that 5.3% of them are called John. 4.5% of them are David. All women combined 4.1. So this is interesting because there is more than 80 million women working in the States and 2 million jobs. The 80 million women working in the States have 4.1% chance to be the CEO of S&P 1500 and the 2 million jobs, they have 5.3%. So fair access to opportunity and power doesn't exist, right? So that's gender. Race, you will see the same thing. Uh, Toronto is a very diverse city. More than half of the population is visible minorities, but only 3.3% of them are on corporate boards and less than 10% of them are on private sector senior management. Again, gap between access to opportunity and power. And the last slide I have here for you around the gap, almost 70% of middle-class black children um, so these are kids who live in families where the parents are making enough money to have them in middle class. They estimate that 70% of these kids will fall out of that class when they are adults. Just think about that. Because of the neighborhoods they live in, because of the schools in these neighborhoods, because of the education system, because of the health system, because of the policing, because of the culture, because of the bias, because of the discrimination. Um, so we have a gap. We have a massive gap in terms of, of social equity. And that will be the discussion 
and our um, second part of this webinar. Any questions do you see, Beth? I can't see the Q&A. No, none so far. Okay, everything is good, Beth? I have to keep on muting. Yes, everything's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's continue with bias and discrimination. Um, I'll start with bias. Bias is prejudice against one group compared with another, usually not based on facts and considered to be unfair. There are two types of bias. Implicit bias, so these are the biases that you have in your brain without even realizing, and they influence your behavior uh, and action. And there is explicit bias, which is things that you, you believe. I think this group is inferior. I think this group of people are lazy. I think this group of people are not fit for this type of jobs. So implicit and explicit. Now bias is in your brain. The moment bias translates into action, it becomes discrimination. So that's the differentiation between the two. They say bias in hiring. There is no bias in hiring. It's discrimination in hiring because it happened. Someone was denied an opportunity to be hired because of their race, their gender, their age, or any other factor. So that's discrimination. Whenever the bias translates into action or behavior, it becomes discrimination. Discrimination is acting based on bias. It's the manifestation of the unfair distribution of power and opportunity between social groups. Whenever you see one group has more access to opportunity or power, that's a sign of discrimination. That's a sign of discrimination. Discrimination is four types. Interpersonal, between people, like I do or say something to someone based on their race or gender or age or other diversity dimensions. Internalized, so this is the discrimination that we impose on ourselves. I work in a place, I don't speak English as first language. People start making me feel like my language is a problem. So while don't send emails to people without sending the email to me first. I want to, to make sure the language is okay. Um, they started like making me feel like I'm having issues in communication because of my language and all of that. Um, and then someone comes to me and say, hey, why we want you to present to the client? And I say, no, I don't think I can do it. So I internalized all these messages. Now I am discriminating against myself. Why we want you to apply for a director role or a VP role? Oh, I don't think I can. I internalized these messages. Unconsciously, huh? The third one is systemic. These are systems we implement. We want them to be fair. Our intentions are good. But unfortunately, we notice that some group, based on their whatever diversity they mention, they understand the system, they perform really well within the system, and other groups don't. They really struggle with the system. So that's systemic. Practices that produce inequitable social outcomes. And the last one is structural. So the slide I showed you in the, in the gap, the last one, um, the black children, they are facing not only interpersonal discrimination, internalized or systemic, it's structural, multiple layer, layers of, of discrimination. Now, discrimination based on race is racism. Discrimination based on sex is sexism. Discrimination based on age is ageism. And how the, how the, the, this is how you apply discrimination. Discrimination is the umbrella. And then based on the social group impacted by it, it becomes uh, specific to that group. Now, just to distinguish uh, between what discrimination means, today we will talk about implicit. I'll, I'll cover it quickly. And then I'll, I'll try talking quickly also, give you the, the foundation of systemic discrimination. Uh, but just to distinguish between what we mean by discrimination versus just people having personal conflict. Personal conflict are, are between individuals, okay? There is no pattern related to their race or gender. Like I have a fight with someone, I don't like someone, I, don't, I think someone is not performing very well, I want to fire them. That's a personal issue. If that issue is related to that person's diversity dimension, like age, I said, or race or gender, it becomes discrimination. If the people that I fire are mostly from specific gender, then probably we have a discrimination issue. If the people that I don't like are specifically from a specific race, then probably we have a discrimination issue, right? If what I said to someone reflects um, something I believe on their race or gender or, or age uh, or sexuality, then probably we have a discrimination issue. So that's the differentiation. Discrimination versus just 
personal conflict between people. We are talking about discrimination here. We're not talking about being inclusive to everyone. You know, we want just to make sure that we are not discriminating based on people's uh, diversity dimensions. So I'll talk about unconscious bias. Unconscious bias, the theory behind unconscious bias uh, comes from the, the theory we use, the understanding that we, we, uh, we build on our explanation of unconscious bias is based on uh, the Thinking Fast and Slow book by Daniel Kahneman. He won the Nobel Prize based on his research in this book. And in his book, Daniel says, you know, we have two systems in our brain. We have system one, which is fast, intuitive, and emotional. It operates automatically and quickly with little or no effort and no sense of voluntary control. Uh, so system one, it's always on. We don't have control over it. And it's fast, it's intuitive, it's emotional. And then we have system two, deliberative, more logical. This is where we actually pay attention. This is the system that we can turn off and turn on. And we use it for complex computations. So we have system one and we have system two. An example of, of system one is, is you being on autopilot. You drive your car, you park your car, you go shopping, you go see your doctor, you come back and you have no idea where you parked your car. Now, this is an interesting phenomenon because driving your car is a complicated mental task. You know, like you're thinking about, like driving is not easy. Parking your car is even more complicated. And you did all of that without even realizing, right? So that's autopilot. That's working on system one. And the fascinating thing about system one is we only conscious, we only use system two for about 5% of our cognitive activities. So the decisions we make, the meetings that we have, the conversation we have with our partners, with our kids, um, most of the conversations we have at work uh, are all based on system one. It's a very powerful system. It controls 95% of our brain activity, which is fascinating. So we think that we are objective and rational, uh, but we are not. Most of the time we are not. Um, and that's where uh, you see our emotions, our intuitive thinking, when we are like having a debate with someone, where we are like just, we are genuine, you know, we are like just talking from our experience and our emotions. That's all happening in system one. It's not really system two. We're not very rational. System two is this uh, conscious objective thinking that you use when you are solving a math equation or like you are looking at Excel sheet. Everything else is literally system one. Um, and that leads to a lot of issues in our brain. <laughs> There are more than 100 biases and issues in the way we think, and all attributed to the, to the, the control of system one on our, on our thinking. I won't go through uh, these, but one interesting thing happening in our brain is we really like to categorize people that we don't know. We like to just put people in groups um, and give them a label and have them there in system one. It just makes things efficient. I'll give an example. I googled the word software engineer a few years ago. So I googled it and then I clicked on Google uh, images and guess which photo I saw most? Something like this. I googled CEO and most of the photos look like this. I googled the nurse. So think about the nurse, huh? Think about your brain shortcut, what system one will tell you. Will it be something like this? And this is interesting because Google does a really good job imitating our system one. They will show you the most probable outcomes and results that you will download, that you will use in your presentation, that you will find in most articles. These are the images that we associate with these groups. Um, so think about the race of these people in, in the photos, think about the gender, think about the age, think about even the body, you know, the body type. Um, and that's brain shortcuts we have. These are all stereotypes we have. Now, the negative stereotypes we have in our brain are called unconscious biases. So they are the negative stereotypes we hold outside of our conscious awareness against certain social groups, women, LGBTQ, 
Chinese Canadians, Muslims, you know, and engineers by, by job, HR people, planners, IT people. We have unconscious biases against these groups. We group them and we have some like negative stereotypes about them. These unconscious biases are shaped by our experience. So I traveled to a country, I had bad experience in that country. I develop a negative stereotype, unconscious bias about people in that country. It's shaped by our environment, you know, the messages, the social media, the movies we watch, and they influence our perceptions, which I understand. But the fascinating thing, it also influences our attitudes and behaviors. So the distance you stand from a stranger talking to you on the street, um, the way you interact with, uh, with someone you're interviewing for a job, it's shaped by your unconscious biases about that person's social group, which is interesting. Um, I'll talk about, as you saw in that graph, there are like more than a hundred of these biases, but I'll talk about two of them that really influence um, the work that we do, um, our relations. One of them is what we call confirmation bias, the halo effect. Confirmation bias is our tendency to accept information that confirms what we already believe. You have two friends, they're having a political debate, one conservative, one liberal, and they're discussing a policy. And you're listening to them for 10, 15 minutes and you're like, okay, this is clearly confirmation bias. They are not using system two, right? Every one of them is accepting any information that supports their argument and rejecting any information that uh, disagree with their argument. That's confirmation bias. We do it all the time. There was an experiment at uh, Yale University. Uh, this is uh, an example of, of confirmation bias. There was an experiment at Yale. They brought a group of people and they say, hey, we have an experiment uh, for hiring a police chief. They gave them two resumes, one for a highly educated candidate, so someone who had done a lot of education around policing, and the other one for someone who um, doesn't have education, that much education, but a lot of experience. And they said, hey, here are the two resumes. Which one would you hire for the police chief position if you know that the highly educated candidate is called James and the candidate with strong experience is called Catherine? Uh, Catherine. And guess which one they chose? They chose James. And the rationale was, you know what? Policing is evolving. There's a lot of technology now. Um, so hiring someone with education about policing is very important. Okay, so that's okay. They bring another group of people and they give them the same two resumes. They just switch the names. So Catherine is the highly educated candidate and James is the one with strong experience. And they say, which one would you hire? And guess which one they, they chose. <laughs> they chose James again. And this is the fascinating thing. And the rationale was, you know what? Policing is a traditional field. We need someone with strong experience, someone who had been in the field for some time, built the relationships with the community, with people in the, uh, in the field. And that's why we chose James. So people, when they tell me we, we make the best decision, we hire the best candidate, we, we like design the best plan, I always tell them maybe, but maybe not right? Just be aware of your confirmation bias. If you Google now, and please do that after this webinar, Google police chief, guess which photos that you will see most? Something like this, right? So that's confirmation bias. We have the image in our system one, we just try to confirm uh, the image, right? We have the belief already, we just use any information to confirm it. That's confirmation bias. The second bias I would like to talk about today is affinity bias. Our tendency to like people we automatically relate to and favoring people that belong to our group. This is human nature. I go to a new country, I'm a stranger in that country, I don't know anyone, I go to a restaurant, I meet someone there, they tell me they are Canadians and I like them. <laughs> I don't know them, huh? I don't know if they are good people or bad people. Just the fact I can relate to them I immediately like them, right? I like soccer. I play soccer and I love watching soccer. 
If you tell me you like soccer, I connect with you. I have two uh, little kids. If you have two little kids, I connect with you. I come from an engineering background. If you have engineering background, I connect with you. Affinity bias, it's our human nature, right? Now here's the problem with affinity bias. We better service people we have affinity bias with because we understand their needs better. We can connect with them. We can um, um, connect to what they need. We are more forgiving, you know? Uh, we understand their communication style. The tools that we design are designed for them unconsciously. That's the first one. Cultural fit is another issue with organizations. Cultural fit is important. We want to hire people who fit the culture of the organization, the values of the organization. But most of the time, we take that cultural fit and we hire people to fit our personal culture, our personal gender and experience and race and, and the things that we like. That's how we hire. The third one is favoritism. We tend to favorite people who we have affinity with. People tell me why oh, we don't discriminate against people who are different from us. We follow the policy, we follow the, the process. And I say, yes, I think you do. However, you favorite people you have affinity bias with. You give them more tips. You are more around them. You tend to be more helpful. And guess what happened? People who are very similar to you just get promoted and move to the top. And people who are different from you, they don't. That's a sign of favoritism. So I want you all now to reflect on confirmation bias and affinity bias. I want you to think about examples of these biases in your organization and the work that you do, and just type them in the Q&A. Type just some, ex like, some examples. Hiring. Um, the work that you do in planning. Uh, I don't know, some relations you have at work, some like, yeah, the people that you connect with more, the people that you, uh, are, you surround yourself with. Uh, is that uh, shaped by some confirmation bias, some affinity bias? I would like to, to see some examples. And, and Beth, if you, if you get examples, if you can just share them with me, that would be great. Um, I'll give you a minute to write some of these examples. And I'll take a, a quick break. Are you typing, everyone? <laughs> okay. So Beth, if you if you get something, please uh, feel free to stop me and and share it if you have any examples you got. While I'm putting it in the chat box so you can see it, like I'm just copying and pasting, or I can read it. Oh, there are, there are a few, okay. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, examples for unconscious bias in my field, males being hired for technical skill jobs. Absolutely, absolutely. This is very common, you know? I guess if you, if you go to Google now and like Google whatever technical job, <laughs> most of the photos will be men you know so we have that bias that uh, men will do a better job unconsciously huh and then when we hire it just confirms that bias um i have bias <laughs> towards people i worked to, uh, with for a long time and those who are new to the organization absolutely hiring through contacts graduates of the same University programs referred by people and network of professionals. Thank you, thank you very much. Ageism, we give students more training because they are new to the work, uh, but we don't always give other people the same training. Absolutely, great example. And it just like to confirm what we already believe, huh? Um, I have affinity bias to other parents of young children. Of course, <laughs> you have affinity bias to me? I have two kids two years old and five years old. Um, so yeah, you have affinity bias toward that. Uh, I worked 30 years in travel and tourism, tour operators, brochures, almost exclusively use images of 30 years old, uh, heterosexual white couples, absolutely. Thank you all, thank you for, for all these examples, this is great. Uh, so you see it, you see it everywhere. 
um, bias, um, really, really, um, if you just start being aware of it, you will see more and more of these examples. And I really encourage you to start thinking about that. Um, part of us being human is we have system one and system two. And if you have system one and system two, all of us do, you will have implicit bias. It's just part of us being human. So that's, that's how our brain is structured. That's how we make sense of the world. That's how we, we evaluate a lot of information around us without having the time to do that. We use our biases. So just be aware of that. Now, this is just a, like a foundation, like a quick overview of unconscious bias. Uh, let's move to systemic discrimination. This is a topic that everyone is talking about now, systemic discrimination, systemic racism, um, and a lot of these uh, conversations that we're having now. So what is systemic discrimination? So systemic discrimination is practices that produce inequitable social outcomes. That's the definition. Um, it's really whenever you see an even distribution of power and opportunity between social groups, that's a sign that you have some sort of systemic discrimination, okay? Practices that produce inequitable social outcomes. Many people are talking now about policing. Why does policing impact indigenous people differently than white people? Why does policing impact people in the black community differently than people who are white? Is that systemic racism? But there are other examples of also systemic discrimination. The example I told you about Toronto, uh, the lack of visible minorities on corporate boards, um, it's not just like one company. It's all the city. Right? So the practices that we follow in hiring and like, in nominating board members, probably there is systemic discrimination there, right? Half of Canada's incarcerated youth are indigenous. Indigenous people are less than 5% of the populations. So 5%, almost 50% of incarcerated youth. Probably there is a system here that's not working very well. And then the last one here is an example I use all the time. Um, they talk about how hockey is, uh, there is some systemic racism in hockey. So hockey is interesting. You, I don't play hockey. I don't really watch hockey. I'm a soccer person. But uh, you watch a, a, a hockey game in the pre-COVID era. People who are watching the game, the fans, are diverse. There is color, there is diversity. The players is 99% white. I was looking at the photos of the Team Canada that won the Olympics in uh, 2010, 100% white, 100%. So that's interesting. Uh, and I don't think the, the commissioner of hockey in this country wakes up in the morning thinking, huh, how can I prevent kids of color from pre uh, playing hockey? No, I think, uh, I think it's, it's the opposite. I think they're like working day and night to increase diversity in the, in the game. But there are some theories about hockey and like why we see uh, that discrimination. One of them, hockey is a very expensive sport to play. And not many families from marginalized communities have that money to invest in the gear and all of that. Hockey requires a lot of commitment, driving the kids to practice, bringing them back, back from practice, which many families don't have that. And network. If my cousin plays hockey, there's higher probability I will play hockey. If my cousin plays soccer, there's higher probability I'll play soccer, right? So these are systemic issues. Um, and that's the interesting thing about systemic discrimination. People always say, I just like many of these police officers have good intentions, they're good people. Many of these doctors who work in our health system are good people, they have good intentions. How can you say there is systemic discrimination in the health system? How do you say they are racist? That doesn't make sense. And the problem is we are looking at their intentions. And the definition here, there is no mention of intentions, huh? It says outcomes. And that's the interesting thing about systemic discrimination. It's all about the impact, not the intentions. Systemic discrimination is all about the impact, right? And that's what you should pay attention to. Not the intentions of people, it doesn't matter. They have good intentions, uh, doesn't matter if the impact is negative. Data coming from the UK now shows that black men are more than five times uh, likely to die from coronavirus than their white uh, 
counterparts. Bangladeshi and Pakistani household, more than three times higher. Indian household, more than two times, almost three times for women. Um, and it's, it's not intentional. It's just the communities that we designed. It's the education that we provided these communities. It's the work that they do. Most of them are uh, people facing jobs, low income jobs, um, and it leads to more death. So it's a system. It's a system that we designed. Systemic discrimination, you will see it in wealth, education, health, justice system, uh, but also in our organizations, the way we interact in our cultures, setting up our meetings, um, we promote people, pay people, recruit people, um, provide uh, development opportunities, uh, services. You will see that there is systemic discrimination that leads to different outcomes for different social groups. Um, if we live in a society where there is equity, you should uh, assume that there will be even distribution of power and opportunity. You have a hiring pool. There is a group of people in that hiring pool based on their race or gender or, or ethnicity or age that are, say, 30% of the pool. If you have equity, they should come into your organization at the same percentage, move up the same percentage, move up with the same percentage. That's if you have equity. Most often, we don't have that. We have a small group of people. They come in, and they get more and more and more control as they get to the top or the opposite. They come in a small group and they just vanish, which shows inequity, right? And that's how you judge the system of discrimination in the system. There is a photo I saw last year. There was a meeting for our premiers. And I, I read the news, I saw the photo, I'm like, oh, this is very interesting. <laughs> and I started reflecting on it. Um, interesting photo, very interesting photo. Do you know how many people share how many Canadians they share the race, the gender, the age of Doug Ford? Give a guess. What do you think? Less than 8%. Less than 8% of Canadians have this profile and almost 90% chance to get to this power. Interesting. Doesn't mean that these people are not qualified. They're good people, they're qualified people. I have no, no doubts. But what led to that? 40% of Canadians working are millennials. Zero of them are here. 50% of the population are women. Zero of them are, uh, one of them are here only. Um, more than 20% of the country of people of color. Zero are here. So what led to that? Inequity, systemic discrimination, right? Uh, and here's my last message to you before I switch it to Ida. Uh, I want you to reflect on your privilege, you know, and think about this. Your privilege can either blind you or be an eye opener for you. The choice is yours. You don't have to be ashamed of your privilege. Most of your privilege, you didn't even choose to have it, right? But I really think you have a chance to use that privilege to help others, to give power to others, to share power with others, to give them voice. And I want you to reflect on that, okay? I want you to reflect on that. Um, I'll move to equity and planning, so I'll hand it over to Ida. I hope I didn't take much of the time, Ida. Thanks, Miles. Um, so, I don't think, can you see my screen now? Looks like you mm -hmm. can. Okay, so I just want everyone to kind of take a moment and just process all that, especially those of you who are new to this conversation. That was sort of a lot to, to take in at once. I'll just take this moment. I also just um, want to point out that often in our work as planners and especially in this virtual world, we're kind of disembodied. Um, so we're often these like floating heads on a screen and when we talk about equity, we need to remember that we are a whole person and we need to feel embodied and remember that we have many overlapping identities and lots of different ways that we experience privilege, biases, discrimination. 
So just sort of take a second, you know, I sometimes like put my hands up and remember that I'm like a whole person and not just this floating head on a screen. Okay, and with that, um, I'll start us off. I also actually wanna say, if in order to engage with this, you need to be standing or you need to stretch a little bit, please feel free to do so. There will be a couple interactive components and I'll make sure to draw your attention back for those. So if you need to stand and just like breathe or do whatever you need to do, I encourage you to do so. So I think um, it's really important when we're talking about planning and equity to acknowledge not just the land that we're on in a way that is sometimes tokenizing, but to really think about whose territory we're planning and to think about our positionality in that. So with that, I would like to acknowledge that I'm on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Skahomish, and the Stolo First Nations. Um, I also want to acknowledge that as planners, a lot of our work perpetuates this process of kind of colonial domination. Um, and we do that in lots of different ways from the actual displacement and discrimination against indigenous communities to the naming of streets and cultural monuments and things like that. So thinking really grounding ourselves in the land that we're in is important, not just as a, a tokenizing land acknowledgement, but as kind of a fundamental way to approach, you know, creating relationships that are reciprocal with indigenous communities rather than extractive which has been kind of the norm. With that, I also wanna mention that um, when we talk about equity, it's important to remember that equity is needs to be community driven and needs to be participatory. So in this session, um, we're gonna go through, we're gonna use a Jamboard, and I believe the link will be shared with you in the chat momentarily if it hasn't been already. Um, so if you wanna just join me in the Jamboard, for those of you that are new to the Jamboard, um, I'm just going to give you a really quick overview of how it works. So, wow, great. Lots of people are here already. So you can see here, there's a toolbar on the left. Um, today, we're just going to be using the sticky notes. This is a really simple, but I think effective tool. And you can just use a sticky note here, click on the sticky note, and I'm going to write Coast Salish and place it on the map. And you can place it more or less where that territory is, but you don't necessarily have to. Um, and if you don't know whose territory you are planning, um, you can visit Native Land. There's a link in the bottom corner here of the Jamboard to do that. Um, and yeah, hopefully that makes sense. You're also able to, um, you can move if by using this cursor, you can pick up your sticky notes and move them like that. Okay, so while you're going through that process, um, I'm gonna continue here with the presentation. Um, oh, sorry, one last thing I'll show you is at the top here, um, there's actually, you can scroll from one slide to the other and I'll let you know. So once this one fills up, uh, you're welcome to go to the second uh, territory one and then I'll let you know when we're gonna move on to three to eight. Okay. So another thing that I wanted to acknowledge the importance of is our positionality as planners. So as I said, we have all sorts of overlapping identities and biases, and we've lived oppression and discrimination in lots of different forms. Um, so when we're working, we need to remember who we are and we need to remember our relationship to privilege. So with that, um, I'll give a, a little bit more of an introduction to who I am. Um, my name, as uh, Weil and Beth said, is Ida Mas Barai, and um, I'm a settler on this land. I am of mixed ancestry. Um, my mother's ancestry is Persian and Kurdish, and my father's ancestry is Iberian, specifically Catalan. And I recognize that um, there is complexity to that, and that, um, that being said, my light skin, I'm very white passing. I have benefited from white privilege greatly and white supremacy. And I think it's important for me to bring that to my work. Um, I also am, uh, I identify as non-binary. Uh, you can use whatever pronouns you want for me, but just don't call me a lady. Like don't say like the lady from the webinar. 
Um, they would be great. She is fine. <laughs> uh, I'm also queer. And uh, currently in this moment, I am abled by society physically in the sense that I do not have a disability that experiences systematic discrimination in our society. Um, and there's lots of other parts of my identity, but we'll, we'll move on for now for the sake um, in the interest of time. So I'm going to go over some of the various uh, dimensions of planning. There's lots of different ways. Sorry, think... Aida, what, yeah. one thing. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> the jam port is full. <laughs> it's full. Uh, so, sorry for those of you who couldn't log in, uh, but no, great. Thank you, everyone, for contributing. Oh, is it is it full in what sense? It's it's. I, I get a message from the staff that says uh, some yeah. people couldn't log in. Oh, people I'm so just sorry. People are getting error messages saying there are currently too many people viewing this file. Oh, no. I'm so, <laughs> so sorry anyways, about that. I think people come um, on here. Anyways, when I'm so actually, sorry. I'm just going to make a second one, um, and I will share that it's, with everybody. It's okay. I think that the idea, Ida, is for people just to reflect on the land. They are. Yeah, in. absolutely. It would be great to get um, other people in here also. So let me just share this really quickly. Um, and I can I can sort of keep talking as I do this, don't mind me. <laughs> um, so as I said, there's lots of different uh, dimensions to equity. And this is just one way of looking at it. Part of the reason that I want lots of people to have access to this Jamboard is so that we can sort of respect and acknowledge the diversity of, of opinions that exist. Um, so here, I'm just gonna share it in the chat with everybody. Um, sorry I don't about think that. you can share it with everyone with the chat either. It's only I can send. I think I can send it to CIP. So correct? yeah, to Wendy. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah. Good job. Good job. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. I didn't realize that limitation of Jamboards. It's good to know. So some of you should be able to join that second one. If you're unable to join, I apologize. Um, 2020 is the year of technical difficulties, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we'll jump back in here. So again, there's lots of different ways to um, understand the many dimensions of equity in planning. I'm gonna go over a few of them. Um, this is a sort of framework that has helped me think about how equity applies to planning. Um, the first one is structural. So it's ultimately around dismantling that systemic discrimination uh, that Wal was speaking to. So a lot of this is about uh, shifting power. Um, and in order to shift power, some of the things that I think we need to do as planning practitioners is acknowledge and address the harm that has been done and commit to not perpetuating further harm. So currently we're working within a society where there is systemic discrimination. We need to acknowledge that and we need to dismantle the systems of oppression that has cre have created that systemic discrimination. So when I talk about systems of oppression, um, one of the things that I am referring to are the principles of white supremacy. If you're not familiar with the principles of white supremacy, I encourage you to look them up because they apply quite profoundly to our work as planners. So for example, one of the principles is a sense of urgency, which you can see in all of our project timelines, which I think ultimately are really constrained project timelines, are a real roadblock to ensuring that we're actually doing equitable, equitable work and that we have the time and the resources to have community-driven planning and to be in right relationship with the people that we are planning with. So another example of that could be perfectionism is another principle of white supremacy, which I often think of the kind of public engagement boards and, and that we don't have public open houses right now, at least not here. Um, but back when we did uh, the sort of scramble to make sure that everything looked perfect, I, I often would question if that's what we should be doing and what we should be dedicating our time to is that like perfectionism in our aesthetic around engagement. Um, I would argue that we could take that time and resources and put them towards, you know, reallocating power and shifting power relationships within planning. Another really important part of structural equity 
is addressing those underlying root causes of inequities. So as Weil mentioned, um, we, we don't have equitable systems in terms of our you know, human resources and how power is allocated within planning. So if we were to have more people that represent the true diversity of lived experiences in the community that we're planning in, we would be a lot closer to understanding those root causes of inequities. Similarly, I think in, when we think about, for example, housing, we have a real housing crisis. The housing crisis is not necessarily a supply, and this is an ideological question as well, but um, the underlying root cause of housing precarity is the fact that our land is seen as a commodity. So how do we address that? What are the tools that we can use? We have to really think differently about how we go about planning. So those are just some examples. Um, if you go to the Jamboard, to the third, um, to the third one here. So great, I'm glad more people are able to join. So the third one is structural. So I would love it if everyone just went in, everyone that's able to, and if not, feel free to put it in the Q and A. Um, just basically what you think some some structural dimensions of equity look like in your work. Um, or, or just ideas that you have about how we can ensure that structural equity is embedded into our, our planning processes. So with that, I will go back. Sorry for all this back and forth. <laughs> um, so our next dimension is procedural. So I think of procedural as, uh, as it applies specifically to engagement. So how do we center those who, have been, those who have been excluded from planning processes in our engagement processes? So again, this is about equity, not equality. Um, we're trying to ensure that we're hearing from people who we have not been hearing from because we have not been reaching them. And that's our responsibility. It's not that, that we're not hearing them because they're not loud enough. It's actually the onus is on us as planners to ensure that those voices are centered. Um, that involves specifically planning with rather than planning for. So I think that for the most part, we're shifting away from this idea than planning for communities. But I think that there needs to be a real genuine effort made towards just thinking about conceptually, how can we really plan with communities and how can we make sure that their you know access needs are met that people are able to attend events if that's the mechanism that you're going through how do we ensure that we create long lasting genuine reciprocal relationships with the communities we're working with rather than these extractive relationships so that's just that's procedural and again there's a jamboard for that so please go through and you don't have to add to all of them but whatever speaks to you and these these dimensions also overlap in certain ways but i think what underpins a lot of it is that structural component in terms of distributional equity um, i've combined dis distributional and experiential um, so distributional refers specifically to the equitable distribution of resources and services um, so what that means is in a lot of cases, there have been communities that have been not only underserved, but actually misserved by planning practice. And I will go through an example of that in a moment. Um, so how do we prioritize those communities? And how do we ensure that in doing so, we're not causing more harm? So in communities that have traditionally been underserved, when we start to you know, put resources into it, it's often done in a way where it's not community driven and it actually results in the displacement of those communities. So how do we make sure that our distributional equity is truly equitable and is it just you know um, kind of a, a, a band-aid approach to ensuring that we're we're creating um, you know some semblance of fairness how do we actually make it equitable and then experiential is about how people experience space and planning so as Weil mentioned policing uh, policing and surveillance are experienced very differently by different people and public space is experienced very differently by different people. So we need to understand how communities who are racialized experience these spaces, how queer folks, trans folks, disabled folks, how everyone is experiencing space and we can't assume that our experience of space is objective. It's fundamental. Um, 
And then finally, transgenerational um, basically just considers decisions um, that will have an impact on future generations. So uh, transgenerational equity ensures that the, the processes and the decision-making processes that we are a part of don't result in unfair burdens for future generations. So when I think of this, I think of specifically um, you know, climate change policies. What do our climate change policies look like? And are, are we thinking about future generations when we're implementing that? And how are we prioritizing this work? So I think that's key to sort of all of these and ultimately fits into structural, is that this work is not off the side of our desk. Like this is foundational work and it needs to be transformative. It can't just be a checkbox. That is not what equity is. So with that, um, I'll move on really quickly to an example um, here, very close to where I have been residing for the last little while. For those of you that are not familiar with Vancouver, I sort of give you this, this map. Um, so Hogan's Alley is uh, Vancouver's, uh, in, for most of the 20th century, was the hub of Vancouver's black community. Um, but due to urban renewal and the interest in creating a highway network, this community was displaced um, in the construction of these viaducts here. So the Dunsmuir and the, the Georgia Viaduct basically destroyed Hogan's Alley and those, that community was displaced. Um, and now, interestingly, the, this region that we call um, that the city of Vancouver calls Northeast, Flat, uh, Northeast False Creek is uh, going through redevelopment and they're taking down the viaducts. So this is a really good moment to reflect on how this process could be equitable. A process that you know, in the, the 70s, 60s and 70s was so fundamentally discriminatory and inequitable and led to the destruction of a community. How, how can we repair that? So structurally, how can, we, how can we approach this in a way that really values what was there and what was lost and acknowledges and repairs that harm? So right now there's actually a proposal for a community land trust. If you're not familiar with community land trust, it's basically a piece of land that is removed from the speculative real estate market um, and it is held in trust by the community who has authority and agency over how that land is used. So there's a proposal that has been, uh, was submitted by Hogan's Alley Society, I believe over two years ago now. Um, and that is not something that has been adopted, but that would be an amazing way to advance equity and to center equity in this process, in this redevelopment process. And then you can kind of go through and, and think about this in the interest of time. I'm not gonna go through all of the elements, but procedural, you know, how, what, what does the engagement for this look like? Who holds power in that engagement process? Distributional, how can you ensure that resources that are allocated to this neighborhood are done so equitably? A community land trust is a great start. Um, and then transgenerational also uh, holds, a community land trust holds the land and trust and therefore can be maintained uh, affordable for future generations. Um, so I'm gonna, am I out of time here? I'm pretty, I, I think, sorry. Do you wanna tell me if I have time to go over my last few slides? I realize that I'm kind of pushing up I against. I think maybe, I, Beth, what do you think? Should you just walk people quickly through the roadmap? Maybe, yeah. maybe it's good to just to stop and, uh, and of course we can schedule other webinars to go some more and more examples, but yeah, thank you, Ida, this was great. Okay. I'm I just going to quickly, slide, thank you. I'm just going to quickly end uh, on the equity is about shifting power yes, and it's one. not a lens that we can put on and take off. Um, it takes, you know, years of lived experience and of, you know, everything that we've done to understand equity and that it needs to be transformational ultimately. So thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Ida. Beth, the microphone is yours. All right, thank you. That was that was great. I mean, it just kind of shows that this is the beginning of you know these kind of um, sessions and webinars. We've had great attendance. Thank you all um, in the audience who are watching and participating on the Jamboard. And and you know this is just the beginning. So I look forward to uh, to welcoming you and Ida back. While um, so Wendy, can we just skip to the next slide or no? Nope. Hmm. We're at the 
we're very far away from where we need to be i think <laughs> sorry guys i don't there stop <laughs> all right uh so uh, you know i think probably most of you watching are aware that cip released the equity diversity inclusion roadmap uh in uh in august it was approved by the board of directors in in late june of uh of 2020 and um and it really focuses on this inside out approach so it's a five year um it's a five year journey that we've kind of plotted out and you know as while we'll tell you you know it's it's dynamic it's going to be fluid it's changing it's responsive so it really focuses on you know these these three segments so when if we could go to the next slide so the first one we have is is leaders um you know and this really speaks to that inside out approach so, you know, for example, you know, we're doing uh, training with our board of directors, we've got, you know, training with our staff, training with our volunteer committees. You know, we're really trying to, to build up our own foundational knowledge and language and, and then extend that out to some of the change agents. So we're, we'll be holding more training uh, early in the new year. So, you know, again, like it's just building that capacity because everybody's at different stages, the country is very diverse. And this was really evident in the, in the groundwork that was done to um, develop the EDI roadmap um, while conducted, I think three uh, focus groups, lots of one-on-one -on -one interviews, consultations with our board. So, you know, it was pretty evident that, you know, people are coming from a lot of different perspectives and understanding of this space. So we really needed to lay that foundation. Uh, can we go to the next slide, Wendy? Uh, the next, the next kind of pillar of this is our is our members. Um, obviously, members for CIP is why we exist. So you know, really quite important. But part of that is the accountability, right? It's it's being transparent. And and one of the things that you know has come up over and over is that request for stats. Well, what are the stats? And we don't really have good statistics, so it's very difficult for us to benchmark where we are, where we need to be. Uh, so one of the projects that uh, the HRX is going to be helping us with, I think right now we've earmarked it for March 2021, is doing a professional census, a survey, just focused on our EDI metrics. And that way we know where we are and where we need to be. And we can kind of plot out some of the, the, the ways that we can get there um, and, and continue to report back on that. So, you know, certainly there's some things that we just don't know. We don't even know how many students are in accredited planning programs. Like these are, you know, I think some important components so we know, you know, what the possibility is for the profession. Um, I'm really proud of the work that we're doing. I think there's a lot of support for this, for collecting this type of information um, across the board with all of our, our partners. Can we move to the next slide, Wendy? Uh, and then communities. So this is really, obviously, we're, we're um, doing a lot of communication on the roadmap. You know, while was at our AGM in June, um, you know, this webinar, and we're going to continue to have these sessions. I think especially coming out of the survey, there's going to be some really important information to share. And, um, and, and that's going to lead us to identifying where we can build more tools, more, you know, communities of practice, you know, I, I think that there's going to be a lot of really interesting conversations that happen within, you know, CIP or across CIP and the provincial territorial institutes and associations, as well as across, you know, a lot of the other allied professions, because I can tell you architects are having a similar conversation, engineers, landscape architects, and we're all trying to connect at that level. So um, I think that's where, you know, the, the systematic change will really happen when it's not just one group speaking. And I can tell you right now that, you know, many, many are, but it's still very early, um, early days in this. Um, and I think, do we have a final slide, Wendy? Yeah. This is a perfect slide to end on because, I mean, I can, I can really speak, you know, the board is fully committed to the EDI roadmap. You know, they're investing time. They've got four hours of training this month, um, more training planned in the new year. And it's very much uh, a commitment of the organization uh, 
to, to implement and to continue the, the work of the EDI roadmap and certainly our work with HRX. But really all of this is only possible because this has been championed by our members. So, you know, we had our social equity committee started uh, working on our gender equity policy who really identified the need for a much deeper focus on, you know, on our EDI strategy. Um, so I just take a moment and thank, you know, co-chairs, Amina Yassin and Daniela Ferguson, Lisa Moffat, Angel Clark, Jenna Davidson, Linda Tam, Erica Ivanik, Nabil Malik, and Jennifer Fix, as well as all of the stakeholders who took part in you know, all the consultations, our board of directors, certainly the, the leadership when we um, started was with Eleanor Muhammad, our president. She was you know, really a champion of this all the way along. And you know, our, our new board is um, fully and firmly behind this. So uh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's one of those areas that I think you're gonna see and continue to see. I don't know, I got a message saying my camera's off. It looks like it's on to me, so I can't do anything no, about it. Wrong. <laughs> but anyways, I wanna, you know, just take this moment and thank Wild Ida so much. It has been a great presentation. We've had great attendance. Uh, we will look forward to making this available to everybody. And um, if you, you know, there's, it, it seems like there's on the slide, it says, uh, to, if you like the session to click here, I think we're gonna have to share that link uh, in, the, in the chat box with people if it's not available. But, uh, you know, I know we've run out of time. I know there's a lot of questions. I'm looking at them. I think, I think yeah, Beth, I think uh, for, for those of you who need to go, uh, you can go, but if you want to stay, I think I am available. Uh, okay. for 15 minutes yeah i'm available for 15 minutes we can take questions and answer them um beth are you available you are? oh absolutely <laughs> and ida can you stay for 15 minutes yeah let's do that let's stay for 15 minutes and um thank you so, anybody who, who one, has to sign one, off this will be recorded right so um if you're interested you know you can check back in if you're curious about the questions one great observation I got um, was about that, that uh, diagram, whatever you call it in English, for equity and equality. Um, we use it to oversimplify what equity and equality mean, but um, we have to be careful in how we perceive that diagram. People of color are not shorter than white people. You know, women are not shorter than men. Uh, people with diverse uh, sexual identity are not shorter than straight people. It's not. It's not. It's just oversimplification. And to be honest with you, I don't like it. <laughs> um, but that's uh, used. It's used a lot. But uh, just pay attention to that. Okay. Pay attention to that. Uh, I'll read this question if that's okay. There's a question from the audience. If people are aware of their bias and neutralized it, was that in discrimination or are there other resources we can deal? So here's the thing. I, I will answer and then Ida, maybe you can add if you want. You cannot get rid of your biases. That means just like stop system one totally, like, like just <laughs> turn off that system and like always use system two. You cannot. You will always have bias. I have bias. I make comments sometimes and I'm like, why do they say that? I make decisions sometimes and like people around me highlight that, no, 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 why did you judge that person this way? That's your unconscious bias while I have bias um, and I still have bias and uh, it's just fascinating. Uh, so you cannot, I think uh, I want you to acknowledge it. And there are a few things, if you go through an unconscious bias session, they will give you tools. Maybe you can organize that in another session. They give you tools to, to mitigate your biases, but you cannot get rid of them. Uh, so that's uh, that's the answer to that question. Any other questions, Wendy? I would maybe just goes. add somebody Ida. recently described overcoming their biases and the way they saw the world as <clears throat> taking a sledgehammer to concrete um, as just an analogy for what that looks like. And I would agree with Wow that you you definitely cannot get rid of your biases like they're embedded into our society. So, yeah. Uh, like, good question. Yeah, How go do we speak with colleagues when we see affinity bias representing? So there is an interest in like addressing unconscious bias. 
Um, I'll talk a bit and then Ida can, you, you can like uh, add your thoughts. Um, there are ways to be an active bystander. And that doesn't mean you have to like scream at people. Um, you know, there are ways to do that. You have to be very aware of like the situation, the timing, the power. There are people who will listen to you in the moment. There are people who will listen to you after the moment. There are people you can't even talk to. Other people to reach out and, and help them because your goal is to help people, right? Um, most of the time, there are some moments where like your goal is just to, like to stop the discrimination and like just call it out. That's different. I'm talking about being an advocate versus an activist. Uh, if you want to help the person, there are tools, and that could be discussed in a um, active bystander session and how to to help others address their biases. Ida, anything to add? Yeah, I think first I would try to identify where you are using affinity bias also. Um, so it was brought to my attention, for example, that in engagement processes, um, we're more likely to talk to people that look like us. Not only are we more likely to design them for people that look like us, but when they walk in the door, if someone looks like us, we're more likely to talk to them. And, you know, in our own ways, like if I see someone that is queer that walks in, I'm probably more likely to talk to them. You know, like we all we all have it. And sometimes it's helpful. Like if I were in that space and a queer person came and talked to me, I'd probably be thankful that they did. You know, so I think it's about understanding um, how affinity bias works and bringing it to people's attention. Absolutely. There is a really good question here. Um, can't bias work in all directions? The assumption that if one is white and male, that they are inherently privileged. So that's the question. And then they, they continue saying that this whitewashing can paint uh, the diversity with even that group, sexual, religion. Interesting question. Um, Bias works in all ways, I agree with you. Privilege doesn't, okay? Privilege doesn't. The fact that I am a man, I will be always privileged for that aspect of my, my personality. If a woman comes to me and she's like, hey, you have male privilege, while I look at her and I'm like, what? I am brown, you are white, I immigrated, you didn't. I don't speak English as first language, you do. You might have more money than me. How can you tell me about my male privilege? But she's right. She's right. When we talk about male privilege, she's right. So think about that. When people talk about uh, your racial privilege, being white is absolutely a privilege in this country. Look at the premiers of this country. Look at the prime minister of this country. Look at people with power in this country. Look at the richest people in this country. They are all white. Most of them are white. Um, uh, so think about that, you know, uh, I agree. I don't really like people to be biased just because of your, you are white, then you are, you are, uh, they like just assume uh, like your beliefs or like, but uh, privilege doesn't. Privilege is just like, it's based on these factors I showed you and like, how, like you have some areas where you have privilege and some areas that you have, you are marginalized based on. Um, achieving a world that is more equitable is, as you are making efforts to be more inclusive, their official relationships with minority groups are often still strained. How do you think planners can address the strain, Ida? Wait, sorry, were there two questions there that you were reading? No, I think we skipped one. Achieving a world that is more equitable will take long-term commitment. As planners oh, yeah. working in the field today, what might be three to five specific things that we could do to make immediate progress. Um, <clears throat> so I can kind of answer both of these questions at once or I'll try my best to. Um, so I think in terms of, it, it will take a long-term commitment and it will take the ultimately the restructuring of power and resources. So I think that these three to five things depend specifically on what kind of planner you are. They're gonna look pretty different if you're a transportation planner or if you're you know, like a community planner or housing planner. Um, but some things that I would say can be done specifically now is ensuring that you are centering the voices of people who are racialized, queer folks, indigenous folks, um, trans folks, disabled folks, people that have been left out of that conversation. 
<clears throat> so that kind of takes me to the second one, which is though many planners are making efforts to be more inclusive, their official relationships with minority groups are often still strained. How can planners address this strain? So the way that we work with communities is extractive. We need to acknowledge that. That's another thing that one of the three to five things, acknowledge that we are in extractive relationships and not reciprocal relationships. Um, we need to also understand who is in positions of power. You, um, you know, minority groups are often not in positions of power and that is ultimately why those relationships are strained. Um, so prioritizing people who have the lived experience of marginalization in hiring processes and also in promotion processes, in mentorship and things like that would be really helpful. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and then I would also add um, compensation is important. So as planners, um, the planning salaries are fairly high. Um, the hour, an hour of a planner's time, even when an honoraria is provided to a participant, is always valued financially higher than the participant's value. So honoraria are kind of a band-aid solution to leveling that kind of economic power dynamic that's happening. So how can we make sure that there are, you know, ongoing meaningful relationships? Um, I'll give an example in Toronto, which is the lived experience advisory group. So they created an advisory committee um, that reviews different <clears throat> policies. They actually review the budget to embed equity in the budget. That is another thing that can do is in, in um, implementing equity responsive budgeting. Um, into planning processes. Um, so this, this committee is made up of people with lived experience of poverty and ultimately they help shape policy and they are provided with compensation. Uh, they are also provided with mentorship and training opportunities and they have a, a fairly long term of three to five years. Um, so those are just some things I could probably keep talking but in the interest of time I'll stop. This is good. <laughs> I see a note here. Uh, sorry, when I talked about the premiers of this country and I said uh, all white, I sorry, I should have said the premiers of the provinces. Uh, so all 10 of them uh, and men. So I should have said that. Sorry for the mistake. Any other questions? Wendy? There, there's actually, there's lots of questions uh, but it's just about you know the, the time here i can see a lot of people are starting to sign off um so you know i, I can i can slip you another question but uh yeah you might we might want to think about just one last question just okay. one last All question right. um, hang on i need to do a control copy paste <laughs> maybe read it <laughs> oh well, that's fine i mean the the last question that just popped up was should we feel bad for having privileges or shame for being white? I can't change that. So I think I, I've heard that a lot. Um, so I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, I said I said in my last slide, privilege can be uh, can blind you or be an eye opener, right? Uh, privilege is a tool. You can use it either way. You can use it to oppress people, or you can use it to share power and advance equity. It's up to you. If you use it for one way. I think you would feel ashamed <laughs> and guilty for that. If you use it the other way, uh, there is absolutely, absolutely uh, a place for allies, for people who support and share uh, power and give voices. And uh, I, I tell people like, um, there is no, uh, I should not feel ashamed by the fact that I'm a man, for example. You know, I didn't choose that. I came to the world, this is my gender identity. I didn't have like a checklist that says, hey, do you want to be a man or other gender? Do you want to be brown or other colors? No, it's I, I was born with that privilege. And I think for me to reflect, to understand the history, to understand the impact of my privilege and how to use it to help others. I think that's the question for all of us. And I think. Uh, Ida, I would just like love are... to add to that really briefly, um, which is. Um, if you are not familiar with the term white guilt, um, I would encourage you to look it up and explore what comes with white guilt. 
Um, and I think that uh, instead of feeling guilty, it's important to see that as Wild well, said kind of as a sense of responsibility. Um, yes. And one way to do that is, again, I mentioned this earlier, but look up the principles of white supremacy um, and how they're related to our profession um, and how they relate to you on a personal level and work to, to dismantle those um, and make sure you're not upholding them. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. This was great. Thank you, Ida. Thank you, Beth, for having us. Thank you, Wendy, in the background. Thank you that that hundreds of people joined today. Beth? Yeah, thank you both for your time. Thank you for staying um, extra long and answering these questions. Uh, you know, definitely the, the feedback has been really enthusiastically positive and appreciative. Um, for holding, you know, this space um, to, to explore some of these topics. Uh, the, uh, you know, I, again, just to reiterate our commitment to continuing this conversation and this work. So, you know, this is this is the, the first part, and you know, and I look forward to welcoming everybody back, including Well and Ida. So, I think just before we wrap up, Wendy's got a few extra slides to remind everyone. Today is the last day to do the CIP membership survey. Um, if you haven't done it, we really want to hear from you. It's quick, I promise. And just look in your email from the email membership at CIP and you'll find the link there. We have a lot of people here today who are not members. You are also welcome to join CIP, but uh, you know, it's, it's all that information you can find on the website because um, we really do value everybody's feedback and which is one of the reasons we're here today because we heard from our members. Uh, other slides, Wendy? Oh, yes, nominations are open for a College of Fellows Honorary Member and the Awards for Planning Excellence. Uh, so please consider uh, putting in nominations for those programs. And, uh, and our 2021 uh, CPL program has, has launched. Uh, you can now sign up. I think it's $199 for the full year, which takes you through all of your CPL credits that, uh, that you need to log uh, if you're a professional planner. So. I uh, invite you to take a look at that. And here's our website. So again, thank you so much. I feel strange being far, you know, I just, you know, I feel like right now, if we were in a physical location, everybody would be swarming up with questions and enthusiasm. So, you know, you'll just have to take it from me with my enthusiastic response. This has been, this has been great. We really appreciate your time and expertise. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.